It's not that just moms are these static creatures that are popping out these babies. We are growing, developing creatures and we are on our own trajectories. And if we don't understand that as a um, tangible, real transformation, um, then we kind of put ourselves and our friends at risk. Abigail Tucker, welcome to the Motherly Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So your new book is focused on how we all change as mothers. So I wanted to start out by asking you, what surprised you the most about how motherhood changed you? Well, I, I guess I, um, I kind of thought that motherhood was just going to be another thing to kind of tick off the the old bucket list. I guess I sort of thought that it was getting like getting a new job, a new line on the resume, a kind of feather in the cap and a point of bragging rights maybe. I guess I didn't understand how it was um, going to sort of overhaul what how I saw the world and what I found to be rewarding, how I spent my time, what my goals were. And I actually was also equally surprised by how um, ill-equipped I was to kind of talk about that and to kind of understand that transformation that had hidden behind the, that had happened behind the scenes. And that's why I was so psyched to find out that there's all these labs around our country and the world that study this um, maternal transformation and um, kind of the the hidden story that I think gets buried because all the physical stuff that happens in pregnancy is so crazy and so obvious and that makes it easier to talk about than how our minds change. Um, I am so glad you wrote this book um, about how our minds change and I completely relate to, I thought that, I thought that motherhood, especially as a first time mom, I thought it was like the next accomplishment in my life. I didn't understand (laughs) that it was like a tornado to my life. And ultimately, I really think in a lot of good ways, but um, I think it's really important, the work that you're doing and what we try to do at Motherly is to normalize how profound this transformation is. And so your new book really, I think, does that in one of the most comprehensive ways I have ever seen. And kudos to you because it is so scientifically rich and so um, intelligible for the average person who's not you know, a science reporter. So I want to talk a bit about mom genes and all the ways that motherhood changes us. So can you tell us a little bit about why you decided to write it? Well, um, I guess I see, you know, this idea that we're both expressing here that we kind of felt as accomplished modern women of the 21st century that you're just supposed to sort of kind of take motherhood in stride and continue on with your life as it was. And I think that that's kind of the way that we're pressured to think and it's a dangerous perspective. I think that um, there is a rise right now in um, maternal mental health disorders um, compared to our mother's generation, for example, that um, scientists are trying to understand why it's happening. But I think that part of it is that we don't give um, the maternal experience the sort of time and space that um, it needs to unfold and that we, in planning our lives, don't anticipate it properly and give um, ourselves that kind of um, mental room to um, grow. Because that's what science, that was kind of one of the epiphanies for me in writing the the book, it's not that just moms are these static creatures that are popping out these babies. We are growing, developing creatures and we are on our own trajectories. And if we don't understand that as a um, tangible, real transformation, um, then we kind of put ourselves and our friends at risk. So that was something that I both, in, you know, I was both kind of objectively fascinated by this 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 field that studies you know what you could argue is the most profound change that occurs in adult life it's kind of like almost like a second adolescence um i found it objectively interesting and then also really personally powerful because i think a lot of people can be derailed by the power of this transformation if you don't take time to kind of respect it i honestly just got goosebumps hearing you say all of that. And one of the things that I found really empowering in your research, um, I'm a four time mother, as are you, we both have four children. Um, 
And it has, for me, it has in some ways gotten easier. And when I look back on first-time motherhood, your work is really pointing at something unique that happens during that first pregnancy to women's bodies and brains. Um, and that this this major transformation, that second adolescence, it's it really occurs with that first pregnancy. So can you talk a bit about what those changes are and what makes a mom brain different than a non-mom brain? So um, labs have started to uh, take this really interesting approach where they'll take images of brains of women who have not yet become pregnant and then follow them across pregnancy and then for a couple of years afterwards. And they're able to see that their brain's anatomy changes um, in shape and size in a way that these labs have sort of developed an algorithm that can take a picture of a brain and say, is that brain a mom brain or, or not? And I found that to be um, that diagnostic aspect of it to be really, really fascinating. We don't totally understand, you know, what it means that, you know, this little part of the, the brain has shrunk by 7% or changed in this way, but we can see in animal models a little bit about sort of what the essence of that change might be. Human moms are, for better or for worse, you know, socially very adept. We're sort of hidden people. We keep our cards close to um, the vest. But when you look at a simpler organism like rats, um, scientists have studied uh, what they call virgin rat moms, um, which are or virgin rats, which are rats who have not become mothers yet, and the way they interact with rat pups. And basically, they despise rat pups. And if they hear them crying, they'll run away from them. Sometimes they'll even attack or even horribly kill rat pups. They find them to be terribly aversive, and they're basically just kind of obsessed with food. Um, but scientists study that, and they love really hilarious foods, like they love Charleston chews and Fruit Loops and all of this really sugary stuff that kids like too. But um, around the time um, they become pregnant and just you know in the days really before they give birth for the first time, there's this sea change that occurs in these female rats. And they do basically you know, a, a total 180. They'll start choosing um, rat pups over the food that they once uh, deeply preferred. And they'll hit a bar like hundreds and hundreds of times over the course of a few hours to get more and more rat pups delivered to them. And that, what that speaks to is this change in motivation and um, reward that occurs and that scientists are still sort of trying to pin down and understand in simple organisms like rats, but also you know, as a way of getting into what's going on in mom brains as well. And so that shift in what drives us is something that I found to be so amazing because you know, as a writer, I'm really interested in questions of motive. And that's what this is. It's a story about um, a motive that that spontaneously changes in the, basically the middle of our lives. And that can be really kind of weird and distressing, but also mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the studies uh, you cited found that I think 80% of a new mother's thoughts are about her child. And even uh, like just seeing that in print and knowing that the, the fact that we all feel so different after first time motherhood, um, we're finally getting to a place of having some research about all the ways that tangibly it is changing us, right? Can you talk a little bit about what those brain changes are orienting us to do? So if you look at um, the brains of uh, mothers compared to people who are, you know, women who are not yet mothers or um, men too, if you, um, one of the basic tests that um, scientists in the lab do, and this is something that I was able to volunteer for in my last pregnancy, which is really fun, but basically they sit you down in a chair, they put this big um, cap full of wires on your head, um, and it's reading the electrical uh, jolts that your, your neurons are giving off when they look at stuff. And then they show you a computer screen, and on that computer screen, comes this big parade of baby faces. And the machine is just kind of watching what your brain does as you look at these faces. And they're finding that moms have these really distinct patterns when they look at baby faces. They seem to sort of pay extra attention to them compared to others, um, the way other adults see these faces. The same patterns occur when you're listening to baby screams. Um, and 
it's sort of this idea that you know moms are even a little bit attracted to these things that other people might find aversive like if you've ever mm -hmm. before you were a mom trapped on an airplane with a screaming baby it's not really a good thing but for for mothers it's even sort of like a slightly different experience where you find and an attraction and a reward in this, in this rather um, horrible wailing uh, mm -hmm. sound that most of us would seek to avoid in our previous lives. And um, scientists think that in rats, this um, these behaviors have to do with this area called the medial preoptic area, which is a very deep down part of our brains. And what's interesting is that this is something that's probably conserved, not just you know across people and rats, but all mammals. This um, this area that scientists have found that you know if you take um, a, a rat mother in a lab and you you make it so she can't see her babies or she can't hear them, she can't smell them, she continues to kind of mother them. But if you um, surgically disable this medial preoptic area, these maternal behaviors uh, stop and um, she sort of goes back to choosing food over pups. Um, so there, we're sort of beginning to identify some of the key uh, anatomy involved in this transformation. But it's, I also want to emphasize how, you know, these are very early days when I talked about those experiments where they're watching um, mother's brains change over um, the nine to 10 months of pregnancy and, you know, the two years afterwards that these changes, um, they, they last for two years and that doesn't mean that they go away after two years. I think that sort of means that that's when the experiment um, ended uh, basically they you know they note um, a, a, a shrink a shrinkage in mother's gray matter and it's really easy to say you know oh that means that you know mothers are getting stupider or we're, we're losing our marbles or something like that but you know scientists just don't know enough to know exactly what's causing this um, reliable change that we see over time and they think that it might be something a little bit more complicated like a a sort of pruning of the neurons that makes these um, circuits in the brain more efficient. So we're really, all we know at this point is that measurable change occurs. Mm -hmm. It's consistent across mammals, but every mom is also different. And mm -hmm. um, we don't always know what the d data means, except that we need to dig deeper. You know, the term mom brain is almost always used in our culture to mean like being an airhead. Right. And yeah. I think you pointed out this like simplistic idea that, OK, certain parts of our brains are smaller. And therefore, you know, this cultural idea is that somehow motherhood makes us less intelligent. Um, I think your findings are at least saying that or the research you're pulling from is at least saying that we don't know what it means yet. But there's also ways that motherhood attunes us. Um, we almost develop new senses. Can you talk a little bit about what? those new sensitivities are as new mothers? Yeah, that's a really um, funny point that, you know, this idea of uh, mommy brain and what makes it, it made it really interesting to explore that was that a lot of these researchers who are doing this work are, you know, young mothers themselves or pregnant women. And I was, you know, 100% confident that they had not lost their cognitive powers mm -hmm. when they're doing this amazing science. Um, but um, basically, you know, this, there's this argument about do moms get um, fuzzy? Are we off our A games? And scientists think that, you know, we may lose some of our verbal recall skills. And that, but that may be because we are, um, you know, not needing them as much when we're interacting with this little tiny baby. We do seem to enhance um, our skills in certain ways when we go through this transformation. Um, we seem to... Um, do uh, we have a heightened sense of smell? We are um, better not only at recognizing strangers, but we're better at sort of noticing and defining strangers' emotions. Mm -hmm. There's some research that shows that we can even tell the difference between colors more carefully than other people. Um, in um, in rats, there are these really interesting experiments where they'll do kind of like Thunderdome rat female rat matchups and see who can do um, a particular skill better. And um, 
rat moms are better than the virgins at um, finding food in a maze. Um, and what's really interesting is that the uh, multi-time rat moms, like the second and third time rat moms, or maybe you know eighth time rat moms, because these are rats, um, are better um, than the first time moms at finding food in a maze. And so they're really good at a job that's really important to them. Um, they, of course, don't have much of a vocabulary, so we can't um, test them on those skills. But there's kind of this theory that maybe we lose some of our um, fancy add-ons uh, during this time of plasticity and change um, and focus on these uh, skills that are related to the perception and the reading of our immediate environments, basically. Mm -hmm. There was also some research that showed that um, let's, for example, mothers late in their third trimester were actually more able to withstand extremely stressful situations. And I actually found myself personally reflecting on that because two of my grandmothers died in the month before my, my first son, my first child was born. Oh my and gosh. I really, truly lived this research. I was so close to these women, but I... I almost emotionally could balance that. It didn't destroy me. Like I think of my death of, at, of another time in my life. I think the way I would put it is all I could see when I woke up in the morning and went to bed at night was there is a baby coming. And so I was, of course, like really sad. They both died pretty suddenly. But my mind could literally not think about almost anything other than the fact that I was about to have a baby. And your one of the sort of studies that you pull from is how many mothers um especially as their babies are new are able to kind of really zoom in on um weight coping mechanisms that perhaps might not have been present at other times in their lives i'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that exactly um there uh is during the transition into motherhood, this dampening of the stress response, which is kind of counterintuitive because having a baby is in some ways stressful. But if you um, study the response of um, late pregnancy women and new moms to stressful events like um, living through an earthquake, they tend to rate those events as being less stressful than other people do. And the idea is that this natural dampening of stress is preparing you to kind of like keep your head in the game and focus on the baby, keep it alive, um, and sort of um, ride out uh, the, the storm. Um, and scientists even think that this adaptive and kind of healthy um, dampening might be kind of the root of postpartum depression, that depression could be um, when this, you know, when a little bit of this thing is sort of good for you, um, it could, uh, uh, too, too much of it can lead to this um, more, uh, more dangerous state. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, um, I had the interesting experience. So this, there's this famous study where all these moms happen to be, you know, the, there's a lab studying moms for some other reason. There was a big earthquake. They were able to contact all these women and get their responses to the earthquake. And they were shocked by how non-stressful they found it. As luck would have it, the very first time that I left my baby with a babysitter in Washington, D.C. to go to the mall to buy some new clothes for my return to work, there happened to be a major earthquake. And I did find that I was so weirdly calm through it. Like, I'm not that chill of a person normally, but I just kind of like took it all in stride and was just like, okay, this is a major earthquake um, or a bomb, I'm not sure, but mm -hmm. I know what I need to do to get back to my house, which is probably 10 miles away before the city s shuts down. And I did all those things. And I just, I guess I, I, I was, amazed that I could see the resonance of this kind of scientific paper in my own lived experience. Mm -hmm. I was also there for that earthquake, but not a mom. So <laughs> yet, quite yet, I was in DC during that same earthquake. So I was definitely not, I was definitely panicked, just like, uh, you know, your virgin rats might have been before mother. <laughs> um, but you do write, you know, that while, uh, yeah, I, I was the virgin rat in your study. Um, you do write, though, as... <laughs> Um, you know, we might be more able to 
to handle catastrophe, but that we are less equipped to kind of deal with the chronic and invisible stresses around us. Can you talk a little bit about what the scientific research has shown about motherhood and stress and maybe some of the particular ways that this plays out in the United States in 2021? Yes, so this is a, a really important point that this difference between acute and chronic stress. Um, moms are dampened to stress in part because that's a aspect of maternal aggression um, and being able to defend um, your uh, babies basically in a bad situation. And so I, you know, I'm sure we've all seen the videos and there's labs that study, you know, little tiny rat and mouse moms that will attack a much larger intruder without batting an eye um, in, in the service of um, protecting her pups. Um, so that's sort of like heat of the moment, mom, you know, glory, the mama bear type thing. However, if the stress isn't like a sudden thing, like um, an intruder, an earthquake, um, some kind of um, shocking, sudden, uh, discreet event like that, if it's a chronic thing where the mom is constantly without food, constantly isolated, constantly in environmental, um, it's something about her environment bothers her, then um, the effects of stress can be much more insidious. The mom's not so equipped to cope. And um, there have even been some rodent studies done that show if you take a mother rat um, who has got a bunch of pups and do something sort of harmless but stressful to her, like isolate her in a clear tube every day for a little bit of time, that um, her brain actually starts to change in ways that we wouldn't normally expect to see in mothers. And there can e almost be like a stunting of that maternal anatomy that's supposed to develop. Um, and that's because, you know, the sad fact is that m maternal... Um, uh, behavior as it's developed over time isn't really as absolute as we as humans would sometimes like to think it is. It is something that, you know, in nature, you know, if you, as I have in my life as a science reporter writing about animals like lions, if, if things, if the environment gets really bad, those, um, you know, lion mothers who would die to defend their um, babies from a pack of hyena, if there's like drought conditions, no food around, those same moms will walk away from their babies. Um, and, you know, perhaps that way that the brain is changing is, is what's writing the script for doing those things that we can't even imagine as uh, privileged 21st century mothers. Um, at the same time, you know, I think if you asked about what this means for our situation today and we look around um, moms, especially, you know, ones who are socially isolated and economically underprivileged are exposed to so many stressors that could, you know, threaten them. And, you know, they do these magnificent things under these circumstances, but there's a lot that we could do to alleviate those stressors. Um, and to kind of show them that they are cared for because that's one thing the maternal instinct is both a really absolute hardwired thing but it's also really um, susceptible to sort of environmental cues and so if we can give cues that are like okay we we care for you you're okay your baby matters you matter that can actually have behavioral ramifications mm -hmm. Mom brains also don't just exist in a vacuum, right? So they you point out that they're really influenced by the environment, um, by you know maybe structural issues around them, um, by their family, their community, their home, their partner, and you know our listeners have just lived through a pandemic where whatever environment they were living in, the support systems around us have gone away, you know and. The lack of a village was a problem for mothers in America, even before the pandemic. But I think a lot of us are thinking about, you know, what is the impact of that support structure and how can we rebuild it in a more meaningful way? Your research showed that the presence of grandmothers, for example, or another family member around really has a material impact on the well-being of mothers and their families. Can you talk a little bit about that research? Exactly. That was one of the things that kind of floored me, the fact that these intangible social relationships that we have can have um, real physical impacts on our brains and bodies. And so like there's a one example is, you know, the, the presence of a supportive 
partner, there was a fascinating study of Swedish paternity leave that showed that giving paternity leave to fathers led to a 26% decrease in the amount of anti-anxiety medication that mothers needed. Um, that's in a way a sort of more expected examples than some of the things that come up in this grandmother research that shows that um, mothers who feel socially supported um, tend to have um, you know, even different levels of certain hormones in their bodies as they're getting close to pregnancy. They are less prone to have um, a whole suite of negative um, pregnancy outcomes. There's even fascinating really research, and this was one of the things that just totally threw me for a loop, that um, socially supported, less stressed out women are um, somewhat more likely to have um, sons. And I, that was something that was just freaked me out because I had naively believed that, um, you know, the um, boy or girl issue was really just kind of an inside baseball flip of the coin kind of thing and um, that the environment didn't come into play in those situations. But in fact, there's pretty established research that shows that moms who um, are uh, subject to lots of environmental stress are... Um, more likely to have um, girls. <laughs> it's weird. That's wild. Yeah. Well, should we um, talk about why? Um, sure. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't why. totally. Yeah, I don't totally. Um, I don't think anybody totally fathoms it. What we know is that if you look at stressful events like, um, say, 9/11, uh, um, about nine months after those events, there is a drop in um, the number of uh, expected boys born. And there's even some research that shows these drops can have happen in much less stressful things like subtle things being exposed to um, toxic levels of pollution or things like that. And the sort of scientific hypothesis is that having a girl in an unsafe environment is a better bet evolutionarily because the girl's probably going to go on to have like two to four ba babies and further your genes, you know, that way, whether or not she's born in a time of feast or famine, but that boys are also, boys are more likely to, you know, have zero offspring, but they could also have, you know, Genghis Khan levels, like, you know, 10,000 offspring if times are really good. Boys are also more taxing on the maternal body, um, and um, there is uh, interesting research that women who have lots of boys are, you know, more slightly more likely to to die at younger ages, which I found fascinating too. Um, so having a boy is a slightly different undertaking, and. Um, you know, that something, it's not a conscious choice and it's not something that happens to every person. But if you look at population wide level trends, you know, there is this pullback from male uh, fetuses um, during times of stress and it seems during times of social stress too. So I'm gonna be fascinated. I had a, a baby during the um, pandemic and I'll be fascinated to see the data that comes out there to see it like, if that's triggering mm -hmm. this male fetal cull that we've we've heard about, or if you know it's a totally different set of responses because this thing is dragged on for so long. Mm. Um, there's also some research about the role of worry in the mom brain. Um, I'm a mom who experiences intrusive thoughts, but they're they're not. There are images that come into my head. Um, they're not words, actually. They're intrusive thought images. Um, and I, you know, reading about the evolutionarily protective role of anxiety and worry was in some way comforting um, because I felt like, you know, I think you, you said it some, to us. I think what you said was something like, you know, nature doesn't care if we suffer a bit, but the baby is protected. Um, can you totally talk true. a little bit about the the way that the mind is is or isn't oriented towards worry and when that tips into a problematic um, you know form of postpartum anxiety versus kind of a normal so to speak worry um, of being responsible for the life of a tiny little baby yeah um, I, I was really um, curious about this 
field of research that studies the way that um, pregnant women and new mothers dream and how we are sort of a little bit geared towards these nightmares of devouring beasts and things like this and I do think that there's a way that we're kind of um, stuck in our anxieties. Some people even think that um, obsessive compulsive disorder evolved from maternal behavior and um, the maternal transformation even though it's something that men and women can both suffer from um, and I think it's something like 12 percent of um, new moms suffer from what could be clinically defined as obsessive compulsive disorder compared to like just a couple percent of the um, the regular population and i do think that you know especially for a first time mom um, you know there is um, an adaptive aspect to that and that you know there is a fine line between paying close attention and monitoring, which is something that new moms are very much geared to do, and then sort of being bowled over by these intrusive thoughts to the point where you can't get them out of your nightmares and your, your sleepwalking. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, 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 I think in my own life, um, I found that there was a smoothing out of some of those thoughts over time, I don't know if I, I, by my fourth pregnancy, I just didn't have the energy to have as many of those thoughts. Yeah. Um, but I found that they did get a little bit better um, over, um, over time. And um, that is something that you see in the um, animal world too, which is both kind of distressing and heartening that mothers um, tend to get better with successive pregnancies in nature, like first time, um, monkey mothers, first time sheep mothers are sort of notorious for sort of not getting off the ground uh, mentally for, you know, rejecting their babies, for neglecting them, but that those behaviors are less common um, in later um, pregnancies. And that, again, is just sort of more evidence for the turmoil that the maternal brain goes through. And it's not all like sunshine and, and, and rainbows and not everything, you know, does always work out perfectly. Um, but um, as humans, luckily, we have methods of sort of coping with these thoughts. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about primary caregivers who are not the biological mother. Um, how do the brains of people like fathers, gay dads, surrogate moms, or adoptive mothers, how do they also change? Um, and how is that similar or different from the brain changes of biological mothers who have experienced pregnancy? So um, <clears throat> that's a really good question. I, um, I think that for it, you know, it's different for all those categories of people. For dads, I think that um, research on um, two father households show that the male brain does have the capacity to become um, a maternal brain if it's like given the space and time it needs to make that transformation. Um, these labs have shown that um, you know these gay dads looking at you know whatever measure that they use. I'm not sure if it was looking at baby pictures or whatever, but their brains look very much like maternal brains. Um, that said, there's also males who never make any kind of transformation at all and are not involved in their baby's lives. And so I think that there's a lot more of a um, spectrum of behaviors that we see in dads and that even for the dads that have, you know, developed the most intimate relationships with their kids, it's not an identical process because there's not that same um, rocket fuel of gestational and lactational hormones at the beginning. It's a slower blossoming, but mm. scientists think that there is this sort of maternal core in all mammals, male and female, and it can kind of be coaxed out with the right um, environment. For adoptive moms too, um, scientists find that their responses to their own babies in terms of like the amount of oxytocin that their body is um, giving off um, is very much like biological moms. Um, but of course, that relationship intensifies with time. You can't expect to be exactly like a biological mom on the first day of having your new baby who you're just meeting, but give it a couple of months and, and the responses become very parallel. 
Um, now you mentioned surrogate mothers, and this was something that I had never contemplated before. Um, but one of my interests in the book was this labs that study um, what's called um, uh, microchimerism, um, which is when the cells um, of the fetus um, go across the placenta during pregnancy and enter the mother's body and integrate with the mother's cells um, in her body everywhere from like her liver to her kidneys to her thyroid to even her brain um, and they sort of become part of her body for the rest of her life i guess i always thought that a surrogate mother would kind of part ways with the baby and then that would be the end of the relationship but you know this research that we're still sort of trying to scratch at the surface of shows that you know there's an argument that surrogate mothers are changed forever by the babies that they carry because those baby cells come into their bodies and live in them forever and may even become parts of their their brain tissue and so like all of these relationships are so beautiful so complicated and we need to learn so much more about them that it's actually um it's it's both wondrous and frightening how little we know Yes, I believe it's the NIH is doing this five-year study of the placenta, um, which I'm like so excited about because it was, you know, thought of as this afterthought organ, and now exactly. the afterbirth, course, the afterbirth, and now it's increasingly seen as a second brain, um, this like really mysterious system within the body that communicates between mother and child, that programs baby and programs mother. Um, what have you learned about even just the placenta itself or what is being discovered about the role of the placenta? So this was one of my big excitements in reporting the book. I had, you know, I had four kids, but I had all C-sections and I, you know, for better or for worse, had never met any of my placentas or seen really, I don't think I'd seen a placenta. Um, and so I was able to arrange with a um, lab at Yale um, to, um, you know, that studies placentas to see a freshly um, uh, donated placenta and to see, to probe this structure, to look at it both as a whole and under the microscope. And I just found it to be um, completely amazing. Um, one interesting thing is that um, the placenta comes in, you know, if mammals have a lot of similarities inside of our bodies. Like our body is sort of like a big giant mouse body in certain ways. We have a heart and lungs and all these things. But the placenta is one of the most variable organs between mammals. And that's because scientists see it as this like battle zone between um, mother and father, basically. And that the father's genes inside the placenta are like pushing for absolute growth, whereas the mother's genes are sort of trying to push back against that and shut it down a little bit. And so it's actually kind of one of the most dramatic organs that we have. Um, and um, there are all these theories about, you know, humans have one of the most invasive placentas that scientists have studied thus far. And, you know, there are people who think that it may be the fact that the, our placenta's penetrate so far into our bodies and sort of reach so deeply into the mother that they're able to divert enough um, blood flow to grow those big uh, newborn brains that we're so famous for. But also on the flip side that the placenta may be, our invasive placentas may explain why postpartum hemorrhage is such um, a crazy problem across um, the world for women and, you know, is still a leading cause of maternal mortality and that it's this trade-off. This is a very dangerous organ, but it's also very important potentially for growing our signature organ. So I could have, I felt I could have written an entire book about placentas. I don't know how, what the readership would have been like, but it is cool. It is so cool. And I think we're about to learn even more about the placenta. Yep. Um, through some of this this new wave of research. So I'm super excited about it. I think you should write another book in a few years. I know about this. Yeah, I talked to one guy who thought that um, it was going to be possible to potentially diagnose um, autism from the placenta. Um, and I thought that was um, completely both out there and, you know, but also I'd already learned so much crazy placenta facts that I thought, maybe so, who knows? Yeah, there was um, an article, I think it was in the New York Times, uh, about this placenta new wave of research. Um, and, you know, what, what 
the article pointed to is from a year or two ago was that we today the way that women are treated during pregnancy there's so much focus on the end of pregnancy when the baby is about to come but that as we study more about the placenta some researchers think that we may turn the paradigm completely on its head because early pregnancy as we understand more about it and the role of the placenta um, like I think it has to do with measurable blood flow and the way that the brain yep. is being built in early pregnancy um, and you know as a mother who has a child on the spectrum like just yep. to know more would be so empowering um, because right now you know right now sadly we're in the middle of a great mystery that affects people our children for the rest of their lives so I'm really excited to see what's to come of that yeah I think that um, you know it's it, it's the other thing about it that is so awesome is that the, the placenta is literally you know not only do we ignore it completely in the early days of pregnancy even though we have the technology to i, I think i talked to a scientist who had invented an app for measuring placental volume early in pregnancy mm -hmm. not only do we ignore it we literally throw it in the garbage after mm -hmm. you know so like everything about our babies is so precious except the placenta which we just mm -hmm. incinerate or whatever and scientists are hoping to harvest um, from this organ um, some of those um, fetal uh, cells that we talked about that have these incredible regenerative capacities that may even be able to help fight um, heart disease in adults and um, it's not the same kind of um, you know, it, it, it's seen in science as a little less um, uh, controversial than other research involving, mm -hmm. um, you know, fetal uh, tissue because it is this uh, an organ that, even though it has identical DNA to the fetus, is designed only to live nine to ten months, and that's another reason why it's so crazy. Like when we build a baby we've got to build something that could live for almost a hundred years but this placenta is this kind of radical organ because it only is alive for a very short time mm -hmm. um all right so i want to talk a little bit about feminism and the biology of motherhood because reading your book i found all these questions coming up for me around how I've been thinking about the relationship between mother and child, the mother to her own self even. Um, I'm sure they came up for you in pulling together all this research. Can you talk a bit about what you see as the feminist implications of what we know to date about the science of motherhood? So I feel like, you know, when even when I'm talking about the book, the book with people, I feel this strong sort of socially driven impulse to be like, but don't worry, like moms are the same as everybody else. When in reality, I know that they actually aren't. And the feminist thing to do is to celebrate that, acknowledge it and study it rather than pretend that it doesn't exist. Um, there's all this interesting work that shows that like, when animals nurse, their brain changes. You know, we in our bodies have all of these cells from our babies, and not just the baby we just had, but babies three babies back, and we don't know what they're doing in there. And I think that rather than just kind of um, glossing over these differences, I think celebrating them is actually the way to kind of reach um, our true maternal potential. And I guess being somebody who probably benefited from generations of feminism, I guess I'm just not that scared about being thrown back into the dark ages or locked in the kitchen or something. I feel sort of comfortable enough with myself and my biology to be able to say like, actually, no, I would like to know more about this science and to spend more resources on it, to, to dedicate you know, myself to more experiments in order to know rather than to pretend that there is no transformation. So that's kind of for me, you know, I, I feel like there's a lot of pressure to just say like, no big deal, but that's really counterproductive. Uh, thank you. And uh, you know, it, it makes me think about centering motherhood in these narratives, right? Because if non-moms is presented as the cultural norm, then we have to say, but we're just the same, we're equal, treat us equally. But if we can say, hey, motherhood is the center of the future of the human race what we go through should be at the center of conversations around public policy where we make investments um and so maybe maybe 
what you've outlined is one way to kind of center on this crucial um, part of the human experience that that was seen as maybe less important, but now we know really how transformative and powerful it is. And so that's actually a real, I mean, not only is it our future, it's also our past. One reason that so many people are interested in studying this stuff is that they think that the maternal relationship is actually the core of all social relationships and that by studying um, how that mothers evolved and how we function, we'll be able to understand sort of social behavior in a most, much broader way. There's theories that this is where language came from, this is where music came from. It's like a relationship that we take for granted but is um, so totally fundamental. And just one more thing that you, know, you just brought up for me, I feel like the pandemic is a perfect example <laughs> of how you know, when push came to shove, you know, the moms were the one who got stuck doing all this work, taking hits to their careers, like they were, you know, there in the thick of things. And, you know, I think that part of that is, you know, because it, unfair expectations were put on us, but it was also because we rose to the occasion in a way that were sort of designed to rise. And I think that's kind of cool and exciting. Um, and not something to be, you know, uh, dismissed. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that, you know, one fascinating thing, you know, when we talk about dads, dads are awesome. They can be as good as moms. They can be better than moms. But in fact, if you look across the mammal family, only 5% of mammals, you know, in the world, if you look at deer and narwhals and any kind of mammal you can think of, only 5% of them have any kind of paternal care at all. So da human dads are the exception, but um, it's also kind of like a testimony to the ancient power of motherhood and how, you know, dads are catching on to what we've got going on, mm -hmm. but we have been there since, you know, we are kind of like the core of our kind. So mm. I think that's, fun to think about and not shameful. <laughs> so I like to talk about it. I love it. I love it. Looking forward a bit, I wonder, um, I want to imagine the world that could be, because we know that, that mothers today are really suffering from, especially in the U.S., a lack of structural support to, to thrive, to be well as humans while also being mothers. Um, in, a, in your book, you talk about a survey of two mom populations one in America, one in the Netherlands. Can you talk a little bit about this study and what it revealed about what it will take for American mothers to go from barely surviving to thriving? Yeah, so um, these labs that study cross-cultural differences in mothers are fascinating. And um, this study came out because they studied, they started studying babies and they basically pitted um, these European babies against American babies and found like they were looking like how much do they smile and laugh? How easy are they to comfort? You know, how joyful are they? And they found that um, the babies in the, I think it was the Netherlands, mm -hmm. were ha much happier than the American babies. And the scientists were interested in why. And so they started studying um, the mothers of these babies. And they found, in fact, that the, um, the mother, you know, this could have been because the mothers of the babies in America were just sadder. And I think it doesn't take really a PhD to see why that might be. Um, we don't have um, things that are considered sort of basic maternal rights in other countries, things like um, paid maternity leave for a lot of people. We take Medicaid away from new mothers two months after their babies are born sometimes, which is like the absolute worst time. You couldn't design a better experiment to rattle a mother than doing something like that. We have the worst of both worlds because we um, don't have these support systems from the government, but we also, you know, especially women in um, the um, professional class tend to, in America, it's a big country. We live far away from our, you know, families of origins and our natural support structures, but we don't have new support structures to fall back on. And so countries like the Netherlands have done really innovative things like, rather than just like sending moms home from the hospital, first time moms home from the hospital with like saying like, okay, I'll check in with you for 20 minutes, six weeks later, they'll actually do things where they'll assign a nearly free baby nurse to go home with a woman and hang out with her two weeks for two weeks and show her how to do everything, 
help her take care of her other kids if she has them, and just to kind of be a friend. And um, I think the more we understand about how mothers are socially oriented, the more important that that kind of thing is going to be. And it doesn't even have to be such big things. Like there's research showing that av availability of diapers is something that correlates with postpartum depression. And you know, even something like you know, caring what kind of um, physical environment that new mothers are encountering in hospitals, whether it's in terms of how frequently the nursing staff is turning over to, you know, is it a comfortable room with a window? All of these things are kind of those subtle environmental cues that mothers are built to sop up and respond to. And as humans, we can sort of take charge of those um, cues and build an environment that's better. All right, I got two more questions. Okay. I hear the loud know, rattling of children. Okay, <laughs> okay. we're at okay. time. We're at time. Um, in your book, you list a number of concrete things that you think can be done from a cultural and policy level to better support moms. Can you just share with our listeners what those are? Um, well, yeah, a couple of those things are um, in Australia, for example, they have this um, thing called the Plunkett nurse system where um, they have nurses that are assigned to kind of partner with new moms, not just for those two weeks we were just talking about, but for years after their babies are born and to help troubleshoot things like, oh, you know, how do we find install a car seat or you know I'm gonna you know or they start toy libraries things like that which are just kind of like community oriented things that um, a country has taken it upon itself to uh, to do which I think are uh, really interesting in um, Israel they have these um, special um, recuperation hospitals for new mothers where you go and you're not just like laid out on a graham cracker thin mattress for you know 24 hours and then sent packing but you know you are you know given nutritious food and like a nice bathtub and things that actually are really um important to uh you know maternal psychology um there's also stuff that we see changing now in washington like um, more money for um, families um, people who have children should get sort of stipends. Um, there's an experiment we haven't talked about that I think is a really good illustration because it's not a rat experiment, it's a monkey experiment and it shows a little bit about how um, maternal psychology works. It's um, called the variable forging demand experiment and in this experiment um, a bunch of um, monkey moms were given um, carts uh, where their food was hidden and some of the moms had like really um, easy carts where they could easily find their monkey chow hidden in the wood chips. And some of them got really hard uh, carts and they had to work harder. And basically both of these groups of female monkeys went on to become really good moms um, and take great care of their babies. But there was a third group and that was the group that got a mix of the two different kinds of carts and they didn't actually know which one that they would get on any given week. And those were the moms where um, their maternal behavior just kind of started to disintegrate and their babies mm -hmm. suffered even sort of damage that you could read on a cellular um, level. And um, that is a good example of how um, volatile environments can harm um, mothers. And anytime we can kind of take the guesswork out of a situation, whether it's giving a woman a guaranteed supply of diapers or partnering her with um, a supportive um, social presence. Um, those are all things that can kind of calm the maternal mind. Mm. Um, I, I could absolutely see that. The unpredictability is the hardest thing to cope with. Um, yeah. So you have attended dozens of studies and you've been on farms and seeing all kinds of animals. You've also been raising four children of your own. I'm curious, um, as you've looked at all this body of research and compiled it and synthesized it yourself, are there some, some core findings or insights that you've applied to your own mothering? Oh gosh, yeah. I, there's things that, that I've um, applied from, you know, really simple things like I don't think I would ever move during a pregnancy again or advise anyone to move during a pregnancy again. I think that that kind of sort of environmental um, 
disruption is um, can be really uh, dangerous. Um, to simple, simple things like I went to a lab where they studied the impacts of um, plastics, like having too much plastics in your diet. Um, and how that, that can sort of interrupt natural estrogen processes and derail maternal behavior. I've thrown away some of my more uh, melted plastic Tupperwares and replaced it with glass. Um, I think I'm also really solicitous of new moms or pregnant women in my world, even if I don't know them well. I see kind of like gesturing to them or offering them help um, or even just kind of like, you know, smiling or reaching out to them, having them over to dinner as being something more important than just kind of a social nicety, which I guess I always thought it was before. I kind of see that as um, something that can have an impact on somebody's brain and body and, and outlook in life. And it's something that I've kind of vowed more and more to do. Um, yeah, but there are so many things that I came across in the book that I still kind of puzzle over and think about like there's labs out there right now that are trying to breed animal super moms, um, which is something that I can't quite get out of my head and need to look <laughs> into a little bit more. Um, but um, that's not really something you can take a practical um, lesson from, mm -hmm. but it's out there if anybody wants to know more. <laughs> I wonder, given all of what you've learned in the last decade as a mother and a science reporter and also writing this book, what do you wish you could tell first-time mom, Abby, um, about, you know, what encouragement would you give her? What would you want her to know? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I would say... Um, I felt like, you know, I got a lot of advice um, for, during that first uh, pregnancy that was like, you'll be fine, the maternal instinct will take over, you don't need to worry about painting the, the nursery, all you need is a onesie. And I guess I would say that, yeah, there's a grain of truth to that and that the maternal instinct will be sort of more powerful and overarching. Um, than you could ever imagine to the extent that you will hardly recognize your old self from one, one year before. But also that, in fact, the environment matters very much to what kind of mother you become. And any kind of guesswork you can take out in those early days is actually going to be um, a bomb to you psychologically. So I would say maybe buy like 12 onesies and try not to have your nursery be like a huge pile of um, boxes if you can help it and um, you know try to accept any offers of of help that are thrown your way it doesn't make you less of a mom that is how we are built to sort of thrive within these communities that have been taken from us recently but are hope hopefully coming back um, that's what I would say that both that the sort of instinct that we all give birth to is both more powerful and more fragile than I guess I'd ever thought. Okay. Well, at Motherly, we believe that motherhood brings out our superpowers, um, as your research certainly suggests. So I'm wondering, Abby, what is your superpower? What is my superpower? Um, let's see. I feel like um, I, I, okay, since, you, since you're going there, there's something that I, I didn't report in the book um, because I thought it was too weird. Um, but, you know, the, uh, the earthquake that we were talking about in, in Washington when I left the baby for the first time with the babysitter, and it was this whole um, dramatic situation, and I, you know, even, even though I was going to only be gone for two hours, I actually kind of knew that the earthquake was going to happen. And the only way that I can, I, I can prove that because if you were to look at the security footage of me in the parking garage at the mall when I was off to Ann Tiller to buy my you know, pen, new pencil skirt or whatever I was going to buy, um, I actually went into the mall, turned around, looked at my car, which was under a very heavy beam in the parking garage, and went, even though I was like rushing as fast as I could in such a, in such a time crunch, I went back and I turned my car on and I moved it to somewhere else because something about that beam just made me feel so uncomfortable. And the only way that I can justify that using any kind of scientific reason is that 
moms are super new moms are super in tune to their environment and i wonder if there was like you know one of these like if there was like a tremble or something that i noticed that sometimes you read about that animals can notice before an event like that that you know they are uptaking from the environment without knowing it so i really do believe that mothers are um supernaturally attuned to our worlds and this accounts for some of the like oh you know mother's intuition how did i know that something bad happened to my child today well i don't think it's exactly magic i think that you just are so tuned into that kid and may have noticed something a, a cue in the morning that it you didn't consciously register but sank in nonetheless so that's what i think and thank you, Abigail Tucker, author of Mom Jeans. Thank, thank you for joining us on the Motherly Podcast. Thank you so much for having me.